All right, so today I thought I'd do a question and answer session using questions from my viewers. So I'm actually gonna pull these questions from underneath my videos on YouTube. So it's kind of interesting. I actually have over 1,200 videos on my YouTube channel. And if you actually leave a comment or question on any of them, I actually get those questions over on my YouTube dashboard. I see every single comment and question. Even if you go back to some of my earlier videos from years ago and leave a comment thinking, I might not see it. I, I, let me tell you, I actually see every single comment and every single question. There's a lot of questions and comments and a lot of times I can't get to them all so I thought I'd address some of those some of the more interesting questions in this video and I actually made a quick list of I think I have about a dozen 12 or 15 questions here a couple of pages I thought I'd just go through them and answer some of these questions I thought it'd be kind of interesting all right so the first one is from Tom McManamna that's kind of a tongue twister name McManamna he said hey Chris your videos have been great uh, let's see, uh, could you give me a quick explanation what it means when a ball python has a description with multiple genes but ends with asphalt or yellow belly? Yes, asphalt and yellow belly. So if you actually have a, a ball python with those two genes, asphalt and yellow belly, you'll actually get a freeway ball python. Let me tell you, the freeways are really impressive. Probably the most stunning combinations with a combination of asphalt and yellow belly and other genes mixed in with the freeways. The problem is, is if you actually take a freeway and you breed it to something else, it's actually an allelic combination. So half the offspring will be yellow belly, half the offspring will be asphalt, and both the asphalt and the yellow belly by themselves look almost like a normal ball python unless you have a, like a trained eye where you can pick out the markers from the asphalt and the yellow belly you can't tell the difference between asphalt yellow belly and normal it's really that close and if you look at the difference between the asphalt and the yellow belly there's really no difference between the two especially if you're talking about like a multi-gene combination so for example if you actually had uh, like a coral glow asphalt compared to a coral glow yellow belly let me tell you it's impossible to tell the difference between the two and as a matter of fact with the coral glow it's so visually dominant it's probably impossible to even see the asphalt or the yellow belly in with the core glow because i'm thinking the core glow would completely mask both of those genes the only way you know for sure if you had those genes is if you actually um, you know, knew the breeding and knew the results from the pairing as a matter of fact uh i just did a video about uh someone's actually working on figuring out the genes uh, in your ball python using a snake shed the shed from a ball python and they do tests on the DNA to figure out all the genes and apparently I actually heard this in some of my comments they're working on a test to tell the difference between an asphalt and a yellow belly <laughs> wouldn't that be amazing if we could breed uh, you know these freeways and the highways and all the different yellow belly complex snakes through our collection and then do a test on all the offspring to figure out which ones are yellow belly and which ones are asphalt. So that, that's a pretty good question. It's a pretty complicated topic with the allelic complex of the yellow bellies with the, the freeways and the highways. All right, so next question, CurseMac 0 tf 2 what happened to King Tut? <laughs> yes, uh, King Tut, is, it's kind of an interesting uh, dilemma here. I actually had a snake, we named it King Tut. Come to find out, I actually did a probe after it grew up a little bit and found out it was a female. So King Tut became Queen Tut. And I actually did a video, I was showing some snakes here in my collection, and I skipped that thing. So what I want to do is I want to show you what Queen Tut looks like right now. I'm actually breeding her this year, and I don't think she's going to go, but I can show you that snake real quick. All right, so I don't know if she's going to lay or not. She's looking pretty good. I haven't actually pulled her out for a while. This is Queen Tut. This is a bamboo pastel pinstripe. So it's essentially a lemon blast with the pastel and the pinstripe with the addition of the bamboo. And this is uh, Bobby here on my neck, just a straight bamboo. As a matter of fact, this is Bobby's daughter. It was one of the first ones that I produced. And we called it King Tut <laughs> because we thought it was a male at first, but because uh, mainly because it had these almost looks like hieroglyphics. It looks like, like, like a little reindeer. 
and some of these looked like little like doves and all kinds of weird little hieroglyphic symbols on the side of the snake which I thought looked like uh, kind of you know Egyptian hieroglyphics and <laughs> that's why we call it King Tut and then we had to rename it Queen Tut but this is Queen Tut she's looking like I don't know she's she might be big enough to lay some eggs this year uh, it's pretty much halfway through the breeding season, so she could develop some eggs, which would be pretty awesome. I'm actually breeding uh, Calico Bamboo to this one, hoping for the Super Bamboos, which would be pretty awesome. Alright, so here is the next question from Trey Barker. And he says, uh, I wonder if that dinker has Phantom or Mojave in it, which is kind of interesting. So I've been working on a Coral Glow that I thought had some other kind of a gene in it. And I'm pretty sure I isolated that gene by itself. And I was thinking, I haven't really seen anything really like this snake that I produced. And while I was putting that snake away, I actually pulled this one out too. So here is my dinker project. So take a look at this. So he thinks maybe there's... Uh, Phantom or Mojave and it's it's kind of interesting because right before you posted that comment I was thinking you know I was thinking maybe this could be could be Phantom or Mystic because both Phantom and Mystic uh, well as a matter of fact a lot of people think that Phantom is the same thing as Mystic but both of them are dark genes in the blue-eyed leucistic complex and as a matter of fact this one as, as i actually thought this was kind of like a, almost looked like it had pastel in it but it doesn't really look like a pastel my best guess as far as what this could be this could actually be like a, a phantom pastel or a mystic pastel which is pretty awesome and uh, I was actually looking back through my records, and so far I haven't actually taken that Coral Glow and bred it to anything in the Blue-Eyed Leucistic Complex. So keep in mind the Phantom and the Mystic are both in the Blue-Eyed Leucistic Complex. I suppose it could be uh, Mojave, but usually Mojaves aren't this dark. Uh, usually your pastel Mojaves uh, look a little bit different than this. That's why I kind of lean in towards either the Mystic or the Phantom. Or maybe it's just one single gene, <laughs> which would be pretty awesome. So I actually took that Coral Glow, I brought it to a Lemon Blast, and I produced this snake thinking it didn't really look like a pastel, and it looked really dark when it was young. But the more it kind of turns yellow, and the more it's looking, uh, it looks really similar. If you actually go over to MorphMarket.com and look up like a, like a Mystic Pastel, it looks pretty much exactly like this. So this is one of my holdbacks. I'm just kind of playing around with this mystery gene floating around my collection. But next year, I'm definitely going to take that uh, that Coral Glow that I think this, this, this gene was actually in the Coral Glow, and I'm going to take it and breed it to a lesser. And if I produce an all-white snake, then at least I'll know that that gene is in the blue the cystic complex, which is pretty cool. All right, so next question. Hellcat asks... I have a phantom mainland morph. Do morphs affect the size or is it just a different patterns and the size stays the same as normal mainland reticulated pythons? So now we're going into reticulated pythons. I actually have two reticulated pythons. I have uh, Lucy and Sunny. Both of them are albinos retics. They, they have some dwarf and some super dwarf so they're not really full mainland reticulated pythons. And I, let me tell you, I'm no expert when it comes to retics. I know enough to be dangerous, I guess, when I start talking about it. But I have heard through the grapevine that certain genes in reticulated pythons will actually slightly affect the size of the snake. So some genes will actually reduce the size of the, the, the full, full, full grown size of a reticulated python. So yes, I think certain genes do affect the final size of your reticulated pythons and which ones do and which ones don't are beyond me. I don't really know that much about reticulated pythons other than I have a couple of them. I actually got them just to use up my uh, kind of my leftover breeder rats. You know, the, the rats would get too big for my ball python so I was feeding them to my retics. And believe it or not my retics have grown so big that the rats are too small for them. Even the biggest rats. And I actually just ordered some rabbits so I'm going to switch them over to rabbits here. Some frozen rabbits from 
uh, from rodentpro.com. So this should be interesting switching over to Ravis. All right, next question, Robert Bailey. Hey, you're a channel member. I can actually see the, uh, the little icon right next to your name that you are a channel member. Thank you for supporting the channel. Robert says, Lucy is gorgeous. She looks so docile, but <laughs> well, I bet she has a heck of a feeding response. <laughs> yes, that is for sure. So let me tell you, when you're dealing with reticulated pythons, especially when they go into that crazed feeding response, they start biting at everything. And the problem in this room is, is I don't have a whole lot of room. I think this room is like 180 square feet here in my reptile room. And there's only like six feet between the rack behind me and the rack in front of me. So it's not that much room. And then I have, for example, uh, I have Sunny or in a boa tub on the bottom of the rack right behind me. And when he goes into his feeding response, let me tell you, it is, it's pretty terrifying. He comes flying out of that tub. As a matter of fact, I'm, I've gotten to the point where I try to open up the tub a little bit and drop the rat in while his head's kind of in the back of the tub so he doesn't come flying out of the tub. And he's like 11 feet, 11 feet long, so he can reach all the way across and get me no matter where I'm at. In this room and usually I have like my you know my mechanics gloves on and my, <laughs> my snake hook and I'm trying to feed that snake without getting bit and let me tell you if you get bit by a reticulated python uh, they say you know a lot of times you can need stitches so you have to be really careful feeding reticulated python so yeah it can be uh, especially with uh, Lucy sometimes I'd say most of the time she's really gentle and I'll just lay a rodent in there and she'll just slowly go over and just really like in slow motion eat that rodent but when she's in a crazed feeding mode let me tell you she just starts banging the walls and the ceiling <laughs> like she doesn't you know it's almost like uh, she doesn't realize how big and powerful she is and she doesn't realize what's around her and she just starts banging into everything and biting everything which is kind of crazy. One thing you have to watch on those is if you put your snake hook in there, sometimes they'll bite the snake hook and they could potentially lose a tooth. So you have to be really careful with these reticulated pythons. All right, next question, Ricky Smith. Okay, so I have a crazy, possibly dumb question. I'm getting into breeding ball pythons. My question is when they hatch, do you go by the parents to decide what the hatchling is? Yes, so. I'd say in, uh, in ball pythons, when you're breeding snakes, I'd say probably the hardest part of breeding snakes is trying to identify the genes in the hatchling, especially if you're talking about, you know, four or five or six genes. And especially if you've never produced them before and you're trying to, you know, you're scratching your head. <laughs> you know, I do a lot of videos where I'm doing like egg cutting videos and, you know, I actually misidentify a lot of stuff, kind of peeking in the egg or just looking in, in into the, the box the, straight from the incubator when the, when the hatchlings first come out of the egg. And then you start thinking about it and you're like, wait a minute, that can't be that combination of genes. It's got to be something else. So sometimes if, you know, you're doing videos on it, like live, rolling cutting eggs and trying to guess the genes uh, I'd say it's really hard to be correct a hundred percent of the time right on the spot and usually what you'll do is you look at the genes in both parents and a lot of times what you can do is you can go over to like one of the genetic calculators plug in the genes and then get all the possibilities and then you can go to so websites like uh, the world of all pythons or over to morph market and look what look at what those combinations are supposed to look like and kind of compare those to your snakes and sometimes you know sometimes it takes a while and sometimes you're like i can't identify anything and it takes uh, some input sometimes from other people telling you what they think you have and the other thing is, is sometimes you'll mix genes together and then one gene will completely disappear under another gene uh, especially if you have like pastel underneath banana I'd say it's really hard to see the pastel and then like a like pastel and bamboo when I first hatched out my pastel bamboos uh, it'll actually completely hide the pastel when they first hatch and then as the age of mature you'll actually see like two or three months later as the hatchlings develop a little bit more that yellow really starts coming out of your bamboos so sometimes it takes a little bit of work to kind of figure out exactly what you have in some of your hatchlings so it's, it can definitely be a challenge for sure
All right, next question, Lisa Bolian. Uh, pretty exciting. I wonder if breeders will make more money being able to sell certified hats. Yes, so this was from my video uh, determining uh, the genes in a ball python using the snake shed. So with the snake shed, they can extract the DNA and then with that DNA they can figure out what the genes are in your ball python. And yes, you would definitely make more money if you have 100% hat based on the genetic test. Uh, quite a bit more money in some cases. Uh, depends on what the gene is. Uh, usually, if you say there's like a 50% like a chance of a head or 66%, I'd say most people won't pay extra money for that head unless it's like a, like a really expensive, like, like a 66% like a hat monsoon or something like that, where it's like a $15,000 snake for visuals. Sometimes people pay quite a bit more for the possibility, but I'd say in most cases with like, uh, like het clowns and het pods, if you have like a 66% chance, I'd say in most cases, you're actually taking a gamble and a lot of people won't pay extra. Unless you could actually test for sure and know for sure with the genetic test, then you could charge extra. All right, next question. First, what's last up? <laughs> That's an interesting name. All right, and he asks, uh, so what humidity would be good? all around humidity to maintain an everyday pre-shed. So yeah, good question. So as a matter of fact, I've actually been struggling with some sheds here in my reptile room. I've been letting my tubs really dry out and been kind of testing out my humidifier. I have this room set up at 55% humidity. As a matter of fact, I think I bumped it up to 56% and I'm still having bad sheds at 56%, which is pretty humid here in my reptile room. So I need to bump it up a little more. I'm thinking maybe about 60, but essentially what I'll do is I'll go through all the tubs and I'll add a little bit of water to the coconut husk substrate to keep extra humidity in the tubs besides my all room humidifier. So if you're looking to dial in a complete room, I'd say you'd have to go over 55% at least to get consistently good sheds. But let me tell you, you go through a lot of water, especially if you're in a really dry climate like I am here in the mountains of Colorado. All right, let's see. Carrie Engel, what's up? So let's see, she asks, hey Chris, so I'm getting ready to set up my first tote for ball python eggs, congratulations. Do I need to put holes in the tote or do I put my uh, eggs uh, uh, to incubate them? So yeah, so so when I first started out, when my very first clutch of ball python eggs, essentially what I did is I used the, uh, I think it's like a six quart plastic shoe box for my ball python eggs and it seemed like I needed to add a little bit more ventilation. So what I did is I put a little bit of paper towel over the top to kind of crack the lid on each side and my very first batch of ball python eggs dried out way too much and they all died. That was my first experience with ball python eggs. And then from there I was kind of doing some research and what a lot of people actually do is they'll take the, the like a plastic tote and they'll completely cover it with press and seal on the top. And then for the substrate they'll use like a, like a 50-50 mix of vermiculite and water. I usually use like 100 grams of each, the vermiculite and water. And what I found over the last couple years is every now and then I'll actually have a ball python egg that'll completely develop and then it'll die in the egg, which I'm convinced it's actually running out of air in the egg box. And last year, I actually started doing this towards the end of the season. What I'll do is I'll completely cover the top with the press and seal and then just on one little corner, I'll crack it just a little bit, maybe like uh, maybe half an inch of a crack just on the corner of the press and seal. And then I'll put the lid on top so it still has that barrier, but it still can breathe a little bit. So I would say yes, I would definitely add some holes if you can, kind of crack the press and seal a little bit, but you definitely don't want your eggs to dry out in the incubation box. Although some people I think would disagree. I've actually seen a lot of people have pretty good success completely sealing the box with no oxygen consistently and having really good luck with that. So I'm kind of on the fence as far as, you know, if the ventilation is really needed for the eggs or, uh, I'm kind of leaning towards a little bit of ventilation just to make sure you don't have any DOAs coming out of those eggs. 
All right, next question, Ethan Quigley. Can someone tell me when breeding season is? <laughs> yes, breeding season is anytime you wanna put your snakes together. So ball pythons will breed pretty much any time of the year. I'd say most people will put their snakes together usually in the fall. Uh, my breeding season starts October 15th. The 15th of October, I start putting the males with the females and uh, I'd say most people, they'll actually kind of vary it between October and November, uh, maybe as early as September in some cases. I don't think most, most people will go into December, but yeah, I've actually seen really big places with where they have like warehouses of ball pythons. I, as a matter of fact, I was actually talking to one guy at a reptile show. He had this huge table with so many ball pythons, it'll make your head spin. And he actually had multiple warehouses and did year round breeding. And every warehouse had a different breeding start as far as when they paired up their ball pythons, which I thought was pretty interesting. And that gave him a constant supply of hatchlings. So even in the spring, they had brand new hatchlings which, you know, most of the people that are breeding on a kind of like, a, I'd say like on a hobby schedule or on a regular schedule, most people start pairing up in the fall. And then in the spring, pretty much the only thing they have left is the stuff they didn't sell in the fall, which is, you know, the bigger size hatchlings. A lot of people don't have that, like the newly born hatchlings in the spring. So it's kind of interesting. All right, next question, Mr. Bubbles 96. Thanks, Chris, very interesting. So if I buy a normal female, 50% head pine, 66% head clown, is there a chance that she's just a normal without the pied or the clown genes? Yes, so if you're buying percentage hats, anything other than 100%, you're definitely taking a gamble that the, that the gene is actually in there. So essentially what it is, is say for example, the snake that I have around my neck, this is Bobby. Uh, he's just a straight bamboo ball python, but if he was actually het for albino, uh, essentially way, the way you get the het for albino is you take an albino, you breed it to something else, all the offspring have one copy of the albino gene, but they're not a visual, so they don't actually look like an albino, but they carry one copy of the gene. So if you actually took a snake like this, this say Bobby was het for albino, you bred it to something else, half the offspring would carry the albino but you wouldn't know which one was which. So in any one snake, you'd have a 50% chance that that gene was in there. So you wouldn't know for sure. Unless you did like genetic testing, which is kind of the newest thing just coming out. Or I'd say what most people actually do is they'll grow up the snake and then they'll breed it to say for for example, you know, your 66% het clown. So what you actually do with that snake is you grow it up and then you breed it to a clown. And then if you had any clown babies, then you'd know for sure it carried that gene. And then the 66% would actually turn into 100% because you're verifying the presence of that gene. Kind of the same way with genetic testing. Uh, if you actually did genetic testing, you know, with the, with the shed of the skin, <laughs> I don't think they have the clown yet. They're working on the pied, which is pretty exciting once they get those tests down. But if you could do the genetic testing, uh, it would either be, once you did the testing, the 50% the and the 66% would either turn into a 0% or 100% based on the results of the genetic testing. All right, next question, Haley Huckle. She says, hey, I've been wondering for ages how you handle lighting in a rack system. I have a pet ball python and have been told about using UVB, but in a rack system, is the room lighting sufficient? So yes, for ball pythons, you definitely don't need any type of UV lighting, thank goodness. <laughs> Could you imagine lights in all these tubs? That would be a nightmare. But yeah, for ball pythons, you don't need any type of UV. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you feed like rats or mice, that is considered to be a 100% complete diet. You don't need any extra lighting, you don't need any extra supplements or anything like that. All you need is rodents for ball pythons. All right, next question. Genoviva Galarza. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Some of these names are interesting. All right, let's see. Uh, my ball python is three years old and still has a tiny head. 
Uh, big body but a tiny head. Why? Very good question. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever heard this question, and I'm actually I'm convinced that if you have a really big ball python and a really small head, essentially what's going on is that ball python is growing really super fast. It's eating on a regular basis, and I've actually seen ball pythons when they grow from a hatchling up to kind of around the thousand gram mark if you feed them really super quick uh like more than others as a matter of fact i've actually seen some people where they'll 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 feed a, a hatchling like twice a week and grow really super fast and in that case i've seen kind of an exaggerated example of where the body gets really big really fast but it seems like it takes a while for the head to catch up with the rest of the body because the body is growing so much faster than the head as a matter of fact i'm convinced that's, that's one of the reasons for the thousand gram wall when you go up against the wall. Uh, usually anywhere from, I'd say like 800 grams to about 1100 grams if they're feeding consistently week after week after week. They get up to that certain weight and they just stop eating. And I'm convinced it's because the ball python is kind of letting everything catch up to the the rapid growth of the body so the head gets starts getting a little bit bigger i'm convinced like the organs need to catch up with the growth rate too and i think that's why they go on the the thousand gram wall fast all right christopher reed i just wanted to confirm you do not drop your temperatures for breeding if you don't mind me asking what are your temperatures set 24 hours a day yes so when i first started in ball pythons uh, I was I was kind of studying the temperature of the reptile room, the ambient temperature and the hot spots. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of your thermostats that control your racking systems, they have a built-in temperature drop. So you can set them for a certain temperature uh, during the day and then at night you actually have a temperature drop. So I was looking at a whole bunch of different videos of all these different breeders and I, st I actually had like, <laughs> like, a, like a three ring binder. I was taking notes on all these different videos and I got to the temperatures and I was taking notes. I was like, all right, this is the temperature that you're supposed to use. And then I go to the next breeder and he would use completely different temperatures and I go to the next breeder and <laughs> they would use completely different temperatures. And then I finally got to one breeder who said, I can't even remember which breeder it was, but he said he just maintained his temperatures, didn't have any drops, no hot spot drops or ambient drops in his temperatures. And he was having really good luck. And I was like, all right, that sounds <laughs> easiest to me. So I decided at that point on, I was just gonna set my temperatures at exactly what he was using and go with constant temperatures and not drop. Uh, from uh, from season to season so I say uh, only during the breeding season I've seen a lot of people change the temperatures and what I've actually found with my ball pythons it seems like when I change the temperature of either my hot spot or my ambient temperature uh, a lot of times it'll cause a lot of my ball pythons to go off of food and that is exactly what you don't want during the breeding season you want to eat up you want the especially the females to eat as much as possible Possible before they go into the final stage where they completely stop eating when they start filling with eggs. So uh, pretty much for my ambient temperature, I keep it right around 80, 81 degrees for, an, for my room temperature. And then for the hot spot, I set it at 90 degrees and I don't change my temperatures at all. All right, so last question from Derek Mitchell. And he asks, so if I breed my pinstripe to my puma, would I get pinstripe pumas or sparks, yellow bellies, pinstripes? Because when I put the pairing into the genetic wizard, I get no combo results. And that is a good question. So keep in mind the puma is actually the combination of the spark and the yellow belly. And the spark is actually in the yellow belly complex. So it's similar to your, uh, like the, uh, the gravels or the asphalts, the, uh, the, the, all the genes in the yellow belly complex. So, so, it's, so if you actually have a puma and you breed it to something else, you're only gonna get sparks for half the offspring and you'll get yellow bellies for half the offspring. You won't get any normals. It, it kind of acts like a super when you're breeding a puma to something else. And then when you throw a pinstripe in the mix, uh, essentially what you'll get is you'll get pinstripes uh, that are either uh, sparks or yellow bellies. So as a matter of fact, you won't get any pinstripes 
by itself. You won't get any normals. You won't get any pinstripes by itself. Uh, you'll either get uh, you'll either get sparks, uh, yellow bellies, or you'll get uh, pinstripe sparks or pinstripe yellow bellies. That should be what the genetic calculator is actually calculating. And one of the reasons I actually haven't gotten into any yellow belly complex is because of the, the problem with trying to tell which one is which when you breed it out. You can't really tell the difference between the spark and the yellow belly or the gravel and the yellow belly or <laughs> the, uh, the asphalt and the yellow belly, all those. Uh, they're really, I'd say, more complicated projects. But if they can actually get this genetic testing down to where you can figure out one from the other, I would definitely get into probably the freeway I think is is kind of where I'm headed for something like that the Pumas are pretty awesome uh, the super stripes you can also do the super stripes there's a whole bunch of different yellow belly complexes. as a matter of fact I actually have a video on all the yellow belly complexes and kind of go into all the details uh, about the complications and the challenges with that project so that's pretty much it the, the questions that I pulled off uh, I think we're going really long here it looks like uh, yeah, over 20 minutes for this video, so I don't want to go too long. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks for the questions. And if you want more detailed one on one questions, you can always go over and sign up for Patreon. You can join my Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. And then you can ask all the questions, and, and those are kind of the ones I prioritize as far as answering questions. Uh, as far as kind of like one-on-one -on -one counseling over there on Patreon. All right, so that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.